I wasn't feeling that great. And I wanted to lay down. And I had her lay in bed with me. I know my dad was at home. The music's dominated by minor chords, paraphrasing Casey's presumed sad TV, state of mind. Closed. She's seen in a medium shot. Medium shots don't allow us to see much of the background. And on top of that, the background's blurred. The function of blurred backgrounds is to bring full attention to the speaker's words or lines if we're being critical. As viewers, we're aligned with Casey as if we're sitting across from her. This is an intimatization strategy, making it look like a private confession, as if she's confessing to us and telling us the absolute truth. These stylistic choices all underline that we're supposed to view Casey as the protagonist, the one who suffered and is still suffering. However, is Casey telling the truth now more than a decade after the fact? There are several linguistic indicators that she isn't, and I'm going to disclose these with principles from statement analysis. If you watch until the end, I hope and think that you'll find this information useful in your own lives when it comes to detecting deceptive language. I wasn't feeling that great, and I wanted to lay down. Casey starts her narrative in past tense, so far so good. When people recall events, we expect them to use past tense, because they're describing completed events. Present tense, on the other hand, is noted, because it suggests that the subject's rehearsing the story in their mind, as if the events aren't completed, but are made up. Casey's about to shift to present tense. Investigators should be aware of this. Another thing investigators should take note of is lack of self-reference. Deceptive people minimize the usage of the personal pronoun I. They can minimize this usage in three ways. They simply drop it and go straight to the verb. They shift to the impersonal and generalizing pronoun you. They use passive voice. Put on the TV, the door was closed. And I had her lay in bed with me. We observe pronoun deletion as she goes straight to the verb put. The grammatical construction I had her lay in bed with me is interesting, as it doesn't ascribe agency to Kaylee, Casey's daughter. A sentence like, she lay in bed with me, would be an example of agency. Casey reuses this construction type in a moment. Let's keep it in mind. I know my dad was at home. Notice the perspective. She's describing completed events, allegedly. But with the verb know as opposed to knew, she steps out of the narrative. Because this verb refers to what she knows in the present, in the interview. This shows a high level of self-awareness, that she knows exactly what she wants the outcome of her narrative to be. To portray her father in a very negative light, and thus shift blame. Every narrative is constructed by form and function elements. The first form element is characters. That's the protagonist, Casey, and that's the antagonist, Casey's father. The second form element is theme. Theme is the meaning of the narrative. In this case, the theme's twofold. To show that Casey's the victim and to shift blame. These form elements serve two function elements. Identification between the audience, the narrator, and the protagonist in the narrative. Casey's the narrator and protagonist. The final function category is persuasion. This is where the narrator taps into certain values in order to get the audience to emote. Casey appeals to the audience's emotions and pity along the way. But I fell asleep and was asleep for a while. And I was awoken by him shaking me. Notice how she doesn't say, he was shaking me. This isn't active voice, but passive voice. I was awoken. This doesn't sound like a story with real acting characters that did things. And I was awoken by him shaking me and asking me where Kaylee was, which didn't make sense because I looked next to me and that's where she was. TV was still on. With the verb look, Casey shifts to present tense. Present tense points to the subject rehearsing events, rehearsing stories, and ultimately points to how they want us to perceive the events and how they want us to perceive them as individuals. 
she knew she wasn't allowed to just be in the house by herself. And I immediately start looking around the house. Her room, what used to be my brother's room, in the bathroom, my parents' room, the garage. I go outside and I'm looking to see where she could be. Here, we even have a mix of past and present within the same sentence. Start looking and go outside, mark the present, while Kurt marks the past. In the following nine seconds, there are several instances of lack of self-reference. She's not in her playhouse. Where is she? Why is she not here? Didn't make sense. Still doesn't make sense. She had never done that before. Why that day? Where is she? Why is she not here? These are phrased as general questions. She doesn't personalize them as she doesn't preface them with I thought. She doesn't take ownership of the questions. The lack of ownership casts doubt on whether these were actually her thoughts or merely thoughts that she knows that she was supposed to have under these circumstances according to the norm. Didn't make sense, still doesn't make sense. To whom, we should ask, because Casey doesn't tell us. There's no ownership here. This pattern continues and should make us question whether these were actually Casey's experiences. Did you look inside the pool? Didn't have to. Finally, we hear the interviewer interject. However, she merely asked a dichotomy question, making it easy for Casey to deny it and elaborate. And there are no follow-up questions, because this documentary is about making us view Casey as not only the protagonist, but also as the real victim. Next, let's take note of Casey's excessive hand gestures, giving even more weight to the possibility that she's making up the story as she goes. By the time I came back around from the left side of the house, I came back around towards the front porch, she's standing there with her. She's soaking wet. We observe the many seconds that go by with Casey looking directly at us and sighing. The filmmakers have decided to include these seconds precisely because this documentary is about Casey's presumed frustration and because the viewers are supposed to identify themselves with this frustration. It's interesting, to say the least, that she's presumably more frustrated now than she was then. But don't worry, the documentary has unreliable excuses for her behavior back then, too. We'll get to them in a moment. I can see him standing there with her in his arms. And hand her to me. And telling me that it's my fault. That I did that. That I caused that. As linguists, we believe what people tell us. So when Casey says that she can see her father standing there with her, as she says, using distancing language, I believe her. But what she can see has nothing to do with what she saw. What she's able to imagine doesn't bring us any closer to what took place. She seems to compensate for her inability to use direct speech by looking angry, as if she was hurt by these alleged accusations. Fake outrage is also a common deflection tactic. And I just collapse with her in my arms. The adverb just is a so-called dependent word, meaning it compares one thought to another thought, typically the opposite thought. When someone tells you we're just friends, you know that he or she is comparing being friends to something else, the opposite of just being friends. Subconsciously, maybe, Casey's comparing just collapsed to not just collapsed. Maybe something else took place. She doesn't disclose this information. And at its core, the adverb just points to undisclosed information. The adverb has a simplifying function, which begs the question, was it really as simple as she makes it out to be? As I'm sitting there with her on my lap, the clause that starts with as I'm sitting is a dependent clause, meaning it can't stand alone. It needs a main clause in order to make sense. The main clause is I was hysterical. 
It's highly irregular, to say the least, to have past-present perspectives within the same sentence. Next, we are no longer surprised about the past being mixed in with the present. So let's listen to the following to get to another relevant point. He takes her from me and he immediately softens his tone and tells me it's going to be okay. That she was going to be okay. That's what he said to me. Now, notice Casey's need to make causation. I wanted to believe him because I wanted her to be okay. The word because initiates the causation, providing a reason for why she wanted to believe him. Causation is interesting because it has a persuasive function, trying to persuade people why the subject did this or did that. A mother shouldn't have to convince anyone that she wants a child to be okay, but yet this is what Casey's doing. As a result, it sounds more like she's trying to convince herself that this is what she wanted, than this being what she actually wanted. And again, all this rests on the presupposition that these events even took place. As we've seen, there are several indicators that this isn't the case. Next, it's time for the inevitable damage control, anticipating objections in an act of linguistic self-defense. And I know people are going to question, well, why didn't I make a phone call? Why didn't I call 911? Why did I even wait to tell my mom anything? Well, now that you mention it... But I didn't tell her anything. Why lie? Notice how Casey anticipates these objections with questions. Answering critical questions, objections with other questions, is another deflection tactic. It's a way of trying to avoid answering. Even deceptive people prefer not to tell outright lies. And Casey invokes the word lie, which is interesting. Why is lying on her mind? Why did this word slip into her vocabulary? Also, it has a virtue signaling function. This is why documentaries rely on emotional music and medium shots and close-ups. To make the viewer forget about the actual argumentation, or at the very least, make the viewer focus on other things. Next, Casey ingratiates herself with the general public, how they would feel, and more particularly, how mothers would feel. This is the shared value she's trying to tap into according to the function element persuasion, as she's trying to make mothers relate to how she felt according to the function element identification. What we're about to see is the theme or message with Casey's narrative and this entire documentary, that she's the victim. But I have to live with that, knowing that I failed to protect my child. I failed her again and again and again because I still protected the person who hurt me. Casey's focus is Casey. When people have done bigger things, they'll often admit to smaller things. Here, Casey admits to having failed to protect her child. This should make us ask if she's willing to admit that, something that most people wouldn't willingly admit. Could there be something bigger that she isn't willing to admit? That's how investigators and jurors are to think. The victim narrative continues, and we get a physical glimpse of Casey's father, the antagonist. Along with the blurry images of him, the music gets scarier, manipulating us into fearing him the way Casey supposedly feared him. It was like I was brainwashed. But Casey doesn't stop there. Now, more than a decade later, her father is the reason why she didn't grieve then. That was part of the, the main instruction from my dad, was just to be as normal as possible. I couldn't show that there was anything going on to anyone else. All of the photos that people see of me out during those 31 days wasn't out partying. You don't see drinks in my hand. I was there actually working. I was there helping Tony promote. While we contemplate the hard question about whether this looks like partying or working, it's worth noting that Casey's explanation deliberately overlooks the simple observation that no parent would be able to live normally no matter if it was part of the main instruction from their dad or not. 
However, the documentary attempts to explain that also. But you weren't going through the cycles of grief. No. During the 31 days, I genuinely believed that Kaylee was still alive. My father kept telling me she was okay. I just had to keep following his instructions. This is extremely important to notice. Here, Casey's giving a second reason why she acted normally. It's distinct from the first reason. The first reason was that her father instructed her to live normally. And this second reason was that she believed Kaylee was alive. So we asked the question, which reason was it? The first or the second? Was it because that she couldn't show that there was anything going on to anyone else? Or was it because she believed that Kaylee was alive? Once again, the adverb just enters Casey's language, showing us that she's comparing following his instructions to something else. Most likely not following his instructions. Maybe because there were no instructions to follow, or in the event that there were instructions, that she could have simply disregarded them. Not as a conscious effort, but simply because she had normal human emotions that she couldn't contain, no matter what anyone told her. Next, we should note the impersonal pronoun you, as Casey indirectly blames people for doubting her. The next clip shows more of the anger that's right beneath Casey's grieving facade, revealing it for what it is, a facade. People also don't know when you're crying in a bathroom, alone, trying to pull yourself together. You can never see behind closed doors unless someone chooses to let you in. With you and yourself, these aren't personal descriptions. She's not saying that she cried in a bathroom alone. She's not saying that it happened. And I believe her because people's use of pronouns is intuitive and without fail. Pronouns reveal exactly what people think about themselves and what they think about other people in relation to them. In the following, notice Casey's use of the word remember, limiting what she remembers, which by implication and more importantly, points to what she doesn't remember, allegedly. And what were you saying to him? I just wanted answers. When am I going to see her? How much longer are we going to keep doing this? Is she okay? That I remember. That, that I, remember. I remember with vowel stress on that rests on the presupposition that there are other things that she doesn't remember. Also, it's something that investigators should be alert to because it's very convenient for a subject to choose between what they remember and what they don't. This type of restricting language gives leeway to the subject and allows them to suddenly remember other things, if necessary and convenient. Next, notice the pronoun drop. Did he describe where Kaylee was or what she was doing? No. Wouldn't tell me anything. Wouldn't tell me anything, not he wouldn't tell me anything. She doesn't ascribe agency to her father, which is similar to one of her previous sentence constructions involving her father. And I was awoken by him shaking me. There's rising intonation on the word anything, Wouldn't which makes it sound anything. like she's asking rather than stating. I would ask if he knew where she was and he would just tell me she was safe. She says that she would ask, not that she did ask. The adverb just enters her language again. The adverb that points to undisclosed information and that has a simplifying function. Next, it's time for very direct persuasion tactics, especially for a so-called documentary. And Casey keeps using you, indicating impersonal experiences. Notice the anger in her facial expressions, anger about not being believed. Not being believed seems to be the real and only reason behind Casey's frustration and supposed sad state of mind. When you're physically afraid of another human being and you are conditioned to say and do what they wanted you to say and do, even as an adult, you're still going to revert right back to it. 